Uh, welcome everyone to this third um, webinar on retrofit refurbishment and repurposing the action gap. And we've, we've got some really um, uh, interesting speakers uh, for this session today. Um, from, from, a, from a speaking from different perspectives, um, and um, and I think we'll really we'll really have a good uh, hour hour or so's conversation. And as usual, use the chat function um, if you want to make any comments, and we'll feed those in um, as we go along. Uh, and if we have time at the end, we'll have a little bit of uh, general discussion. Um, I'm not going to introduce uh, the panel members uh, in detail. I'll let them do that for themselves. Um, but we've got Claude uh, Santaroman, who has really, you know, dreamt up the idea of running these uh, webinars over the, over the, the summer. Um, so really, Cl Claude will be chipping in and uh, and um, giving her thoughts on on what we're here today. We've got Oslem Duran, who's going to be talking uh, first off uh, from the University of Lincoln, but joining us today from Turkey. So we appreciate that you that you've joined us during, I think, annual leave. Um, and Rick Lee from, from Arab, who uh, um, I think is probably joining us from close, from nearer to home, um, I suspect, but uh, also very welcome. Uh, we have a couple of colleagues joining us from Page Park Architects, as I say, um, they're having some slight problems getting into the webinar, so we'll sort that out um, uh, in the next 10-15 uh, minutes. Um, but uh, really, without further ado, I'd like to um, invite Oslem to, to kick things off and share, share your screen and 15-20 um, minutes to, to talk to us. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for inviting me, um, first of all. Uh, I'm Oslem. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer in architectural technology at the University of uh, Lincoln. Uh, my background is in architecture. I worked as an architect for several years before moving on to academia. And uh, my expertise area is building physics, uh, specially specializing in building performance analysis. Um, I'll be talking about uh, my uh, PhD project to today, uh, which focused on uh, retrofit of uh, retrofit decision making of a post-war office buildings. Uh, could you confirm that you are seeing the seeing my presentation well? It's not come through yet, no. No. Yeah, it's, it's coming up now. It's coming up. Yeah, it's there. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, just a second, right. Uh, again, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'd like to talk about non-domestic building retrofit today, focusing on decision-making process in industry. How can we convince industry to consider non-domestic building retrofit? Uh, this presentation, as I mentioned, derived from my PhD project at Loughborough University, uh, but also informed by my experience in industry as an architect who worked mainly for a non-domestic building design and construction. Um, about a decade ago, I was working in Arup Istanbul office uh, where I have participated in a number of large scale non-domestic building design, which I had close contacts with clients. Uh, this experience allowed me to observe how decision-making process is in industry and I should say, I was, it was significantly profit-driven. This is not unexpected or surprising considering the nature of the work, especially for commercial buildings. However, when we think about the scale, the smallest project I worked in was about 100,000 square meters. Uh, the impact of each non-domestic building on environment is enormous, uh, therefore, Decision-making that aims to uh, achieve sustainability goals is even more important for non-domestic buildings. And the question is, how can we interfere worryingly uh, profit-driven decision-making process in non-domestic building industry? And in this case, uh, focusing on retrofit. I think uh, it is worth to talk about a few statistics on uh, non-domestic building sector as well as post-war office buildings. Um, to set the context, uh, non-domestic buildings were responsible of 15% 15, 15 of UK total energy consumption in 2020. 
Uh, this number varies between 15 to 20 over the years in last decade. Um, office buildings are one of the highest energy consuming stock by 17%, same as retail buildings followed by industrial buildings. And 19% of the stock was built between 1940s and uh, 1985, before the first major regulation in energy performance of non-domestic buildings came in, in 1984. Uh, this specific building stock, so-called post-war office buildings, are quite eligible to retrofitting because, I'm um, sorry, because uh, they are excessively high energy consumers and not yet at the end of their lifespan. They uh, form uh, a 3% of UK non-domestic energy consumption. And I will come back to this uh, figure in a bit. Uh, we are all very familiar with this uh, building stock. It is a very common modernist type uh, of buildings uh, with framed structure and heavy or lightweight walls, very poor, poor performing envelope. Uh, depending on the plan type, uh, it could be a naturally ventilated uh, if it is corridor type plan or uh, mechanically ventilated if it is um, open office, office type plan. Glazing ratio might differ greatly as well from 30% to 100%. In any case, though, U values of uh, building components and glazing are likely to be very high. For example, uh, external walls are likely to be between 1.7 to 2 um, watt square meter per Kelvin. Whereas Part L2B, the regulation for retrofit at the moment, demands uh, 0.3, and NRFIT, a passive house retrofit standard, uh, demands 0 0.15 and same applies for glazing. Glazing uh, of, of post-war office buildings are likely to be 5.8 uh, watt square meter per Kelvin, whereas an airfit requires only 0 0.8. Therefore, expectedly, uh, the energy consumption is significantly high and benchmarks go up to 200 kilowatt hour per square meter. In addition to High energy consumption, uh, these buildings, the occupants of these buildings also suffer from thermal discomfort because of the poor envelope, no matter how high the air temperature is, how uh, high uh, the, temper the space is heated, the operative temperature, the average of radiant and air temperature could not be reached to the thermal comfort levels required by the regulations. For those, uh, especially who sits uh, around the perimeter of the building, because of the radiant temperature, low radiant temperature, they continuously feel cold or warm. And in addition to that, well, uh, although it's a subjective judgment, I think uh, we could maybe agree that these buildings also have uh, aesthetical problems. Um, considering the state of the stock and the great potential for energy savings, uh, the aim of my project was evaluation of the retrofit decision-making process of post-war office buildings in order to create a guidance, optimizing energy reduction, thermal comfort, and costs. Um, despite the diversity in the design, in this building stock, uh, it was possible to group buildings according to uh, plan stereotypes. And the most uh, common one was a cellular plan type, which represents 34% of the post-war office building. Uh, by retrofitting corridor type post-war office buildings, 1% of all UK non-domestic energy consumption could be reduced by 65%. This means a 0.22 million ton oil equivalent. 1% uh, as a figure may not sound like a big number, but uh, if, we, if we want to uh, estimate 
it's roughly equal to 1.5 million of individual housing retrofits. So it's actually a great number. Uh, I'm pointing out this to highlight the potential uh, impact of non-domestic retrofitting because of its scale and significant wasted energy consumption. Uh, certainly not to say we should prioritize non-domestic retrofit over domestic retrofit. And I'll come back to these figures again. Um, it might be worth to quickly describe uh, what uh, I have done before introducing the outputs, the optimized results. Uh, in order to capture variations of post-war building stock uh, and retrofit strategies, I chose the parameters listed here. Uh, and developed combinations. In addition to location and orientation, I looked at retrofitting uh, to Partel uh, level, as well as uh, an airfit level. And I also looked at 2015 climate conditions to future-proof the retrofit design. Uh, I wanted to be able to evaluate the individual retrofit combinations instead of global optimization, instead of uh, forming um, uh, combination clusters and parade of fronts. I wanted to be able to evaluate every individual combination. Um, therefore, I decided to optimize heating and cooling interventions for each combination of location, weather data, orientation, envelope alteration to Partel and NRFIT standards. Overall, the cluster was reduced to 256 combinations, which significantly captured the most possible retrofit measures on choosing building stock. Uh, and passive and active cooling packages were also introduced because initial results show that creating well-insulated envelope provided significant energy reduction and winter thermal comfort, but failed summer comfort because UK is, uh, as you feel at the moment, uh, warm and will be getting even warmer. Uh, using thermal comfort as a constraint and looking at the trade-off between energy consumption reduction and costs provided the optimal retrofit solutions for this uh, non-domestic building stock. I will talk about uh, the optimal solutions in a bit, but before that, let's jump back to the industry and profit-oriented decision-making because the assessment method we have suggested in this project is also likely uh, to provide us with the answer of how we can convince the industry to retrofit. Well, first things first, uh, the central dilemma. Um, the occupier benefits from the energy cost savings after retrofit. However, the investor pays for the cost of the retrofit and doesn't benefit from uh, this energy savings. This has been suggested in literature as one of the explanations for sluggish penetration of energy efficiency technologies into the retrofit market. To represent this reality, I calculated the costs in two groups. The cost benefit when the building is used by the owner, uh, a 20% of the whole offices, uh, and the cost benefit when buildings are led to tenants. The cost benefit to uh, when used by owner is calculated summing energy cost benefit, uh, productivity cost benefit, and subtracting investment costs, investment costs. I will come back to productivity cost benefit in a minute. Uh, I will explain it. And then a cost benefit to when buildings are led to tenants is subtracting investment cost from rent increased benefit. Well, uh, what is uh, rent increased benefit? In Germany, for example, uh, landlords have been entitled to increase the rent by 12, uh, sorry, 11% of the retrofit investment cost since 2011. Um, in the UK, however, there is no regulation uh, which 
entitles building owners to increase the rent of retrofitted buildings. Um, I think regulations need to be updated, providing a secure benefit for the building owners. Uh, in locations such as London, where the demand is dramatically high, the increase happens rather naturally. But uh, if the regulations permit the increase, uh, the results show that 80% of post-war office buildings produce, produce profit uh, by retrofitting. Um, of course, here I can only talk about the building stock I analyzed, but it wouldn't be a significantly wrong assumption that the rent increase could be applied to most commercially rented buildings and owners make profit out of it, hence retrofit decision making. I think this is a great news for the building owners who rent their uh, office buildings, but why would companies rent a more expensive office? And also, how about that 20% who resides in their own, uh, own building? There comes the productivity cost benefit, uh, which is like a missing puzzle piece of the cost assessments. Uh, and it is in fact significant because companies spare roughly 70% of their uh, expenses to salaries. And lack of productivity simply means waste of money. Uh, and thermal discomfort uh, proved to be a factor that reduces productivity. Uh, please remember, uh, even if these buildings, post-war office buildings, are heated or cooled uh, to a level that regulations require, Occupants don't feel thermally comfortable because of the poor envelope. Um, regardless of to what temperature you try to heat or cool. And there's a rule of thumb, the ratio of bills rent to salary is 1, 10, and 100. Of course, this, uh, this, this, this differs based on the case, but roughly speaking, and undermining the cost of lack of productivity due to poorly performing buildings, hence this thermal discomfort is clearly a hidden cost for companies, which could be as high as energy savings and retrofit can overcome this. Uh, the numbers provided here are sensitive to assumptions such as average salary per person, but uh, provides good comparison between cases. Um, the productivity cost benefit outcome of two group of combinations uh, which resulted in optimal solutions, and I'll talk about uh, them in a minute, suggest productivity cost savings could be as high as energy savings. Um, I should also highlight that uh, I didn't include in the analysis the effect of ventilation on productivity, but provided adequate level of ventilation regardless. And also cost of other impacts such as sick leave uh, were not evaluated. But again, it wouldn't be a significantly wrong assumption that including the improvement those phenomena in the analysis would support the argument even more. Um, applying the methodology uh, described here, uh, the overall evaluation of retrofit strategies for post-war office buildings optimizing energy reduction, thermal comfort, and costs resulted in that. Optimal solutions are the combinations of, of part L to be retrofit, the existing regulations, but with passive summer uh, summertime overheating interventions. Night ventilation is a must, blinds and or overhangs. This means neglecting passive cooling results in overheating. Um, in this study, we have used medium level warmer future, future weather predictions, but, uh, and the trajectory shows that it might be the case, uh, actually high level of uh, future uh, warmer uh, temperatures are expected. In that case, um, an airfit standard can be a, a very important alternative for achieving resilience to climate warming 
provided mixed mode ventilation with passive cooling is adopted. So to conclude, in addition to all the uh, statements above, uh, this work indicates that the building regulations should be strengthened to curb the risk of summertime overheating, both now and in the future. Currently in the UK, building regulations do not require any over overheating analysis for non-domestic retrofits. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, uh, please do contact me after this webinar or anytime uh, if you have any questions or if you would like to collaborate in any in, in form. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a that was a fascinating talk, and um, really appreciate uh, you sparing the time today. Um, uh, maybe I'm going to, because uh, Claude is always the the, the go-to person um, to 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 kick these uh, the questions off. So maybe Claude would like to um, ask you some questions. Uh, well, what I found most interesting is the fact that I've been arguing for a long time that you shouldn't just look at the building; you should also look at the people and how they are operating within the building. Um, you didn't mention the word adaptive comfort. Um, did this come in or um, there's um, a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of debate about whether office workers should be able to localize their own environment and all these elements. I have actually used adaptive uh, comfort uh, standards uh, for analyzing the thermal comfort. So it, it's been a, the uh, analysis involved adaptive comfort standard uh, based on adaptive comfort. Um, but I haven't solely looked at uh, the behavior. Having said that, um, at the moment, we are running a post occupancy evaluation on a uh, Brigham Excellent University building. Um, and this is coming up with that as well, not even, you know, uh, retrofit of a uh, post-war office building, but in a very newly building, built building, the same problem applies. So yes, um, certainly have to look at. Yeah, it's very interesting because these debates about retrofit are actually informing new build as well, which um, seems to be a theme that comes up again and again now on the planning committee in particular. Mm, really. I, I was I was curious by um, a statement in one of the slides where you talked about the, the occupier benefiting from the energy cost savings, but the investor paying for the cost of retrofit. I mean, so is it not practical or possible to, to pass on those uh, savings direct to the uh, the occupier? Is there always is, is there always going to be a gap that, that I don't know is it, is it an expectation about what, what you know what is reasonable to, to pay mm -hmm. uh, as a as a tenant? Why did why why was that state? Why did he make that particular statement? Um, to highlight uh, the problem, and uh, in this case, our suggestion was the rent increase, uh, kind of uh, transferring that savings to uh, the owner is in the form of rent increase, which is already a a formal way of you know uh, transferring money from tenant to the owner anyway so uh, allocating that uh, opportunity by regulation to the owners um, mm -hmm. uh, might uh, mean that the savings actually transfer to the owners therefore owners are more inclined to uh, retrofit otherwise they don't really have a strong driver yeah that's really interesting. Uh, anyone else got any comments from the panel before we move on? Because we, we are slightly pushed for time, uh, but uh, we may have some opportunities at the end if 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 um, if we um, have some time to, to have a few more uh, comments and and um, uh, a bit more of a, a bit more of a discussion. Uh, but, I have to uh, apologize, sorry. though. I have to apologize. I will have to leave earlier because of my flight. I might yeah. just disappear in a second or so. I apologize, everybody. No, of course. Contact but, me but, later. But, of course. But there may be things that you've mentioned that we can we can talk about uh, mm -hmm. uh, sure. amongst ourselves, if you see what I mean. So really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, yeah, have a, have a safe flight. And, um, uh, you know, Particularly, given you that you're on on leave, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, uh, Rick. I think you're you're next up, um, Rick Rick Lee from from our up. You can uh, uh, let you introduce yourself. Um, you should be able to share the screen now. Thanks, Rick. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, can everyone see that? Okay. 
Yep. Great. So, yeah, I'm I'm Rick Lee. I'm a structural engineer uh, based in Leeds, uh, for Arup, and uh, I specialise in retrofit and heritage. Um, and I'm going to discuss a few things to you today. I'm going to talk about some uh, the case for reusing existing buildings, give some kind of case studies of uh, of uh, projects we've worked on, and then I'm also going to discuss the utilizing digital technology and retrofit. So the first thing is kind of the case for reuse. So the there's quite a lot of uh, compelling arguments and, and the most strong one for reuse is the embodied carbon is already within the building and there's 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 huge potential over new build. Uh, there's a few statistics on the page that are, are quite uh, uh, interesting in terms of uh, the the amount of carbon used during construction uh, is is roughly equivalent to thirty years of operational carbon, uh, and then there's a, a a lot of waste generated in the UK comes from the actual construction and demolition, and uh, interestingly, it's it's estimated that eighty percent of the buildings that we need in twenty fifty are already built. So why, why don't buildings get reused? What are the common, common pitfalls? So the location has a, has a big element on that. Uh, London obviously is a bit uh, of a stronger economic climate to, to other parts of the UK and it, it, it occupies differently. So there is a bit of a more of a, things happen more naturally down in London as mentioned in the previous presentations rather than other parts of London. So. The, the 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 rental income and the economic environment of certain locations don't don't always uh, stack up for re retrofit uh, structural condition uh, if if the building's in particular poor condition and, and the cost of strengthening and uh, actually bring it back into operational use can be quite significant uh, there there can be a lot of risk uh, within retrofit projects and uh, one of the things we work quite strongly on uh, when we're on the design team is kind of the risk profile and trying to reduce that risk and get cost certainty as early as we can in the scheme. Uh, and also meeting the current standards and best practice in terms of kind of thermal occupancy uh, and also kind of uh, accessibility across the site can, can, can often be a challenge. Uh, and then there's just the pure economics stacking up of cost versus of adaption versus Kind of the return of it and again that is linked to location so the first one i'm going to talk about is actually based in london uh, but it's quite a, a strong case study for the success of kind of what we're predicting is quite a it's going to be quite a common kind of type of project which is kind of a an office building which has got plenty of life left in it but uh, it doesn't meet the demands of the current kind of uh, occupants uh, so this one's was owned by British Land. So it was a it was a 1980s uh, former banking building. As you can see from the photo, it was uh, it was probably pretty impressive at the time, but uh, it it, it qu things quickly looked dated, and it, it 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 didn't the office didn't meet what people want these days in an office, which is kind of the the desired modern workplace features that were kind of earmarks for this project was kind of in improving the clear heights in the offices, exposing the structural detail in, that was uh, previously hidden by suspended ceilings, uh, yeah, including an isolated, uh, acoustically isolated cinema uh, within a newly double height space, and also a big grand animated uh, atrium for uh, when people enter the building, and also uh, a roof terrace with uh, with with views, but and it was also important that uh, that there was good access to that. So the, I guess the big the big win on this project was the the structural and embodied carbon for this project was calculated at twelve kilograms per meter squared, which uh, if you compare that to an average structural frame, so this isn't total total construction, this is the frame. Uh, of 350 kilograms per meter squared, it, it's 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 a compelling argument for for the strengths of retrofit environmentally, 
And then if you take a look at the, the graph there shows the design targets for structural embodied carbon to meet the one and a half percent, uh, one and a half degree climate target. So it's, it's quite ambitious and, 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 and steeply ramping. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, good evidence for use of retrofit from, from just that graph alone. Uh, so we think this, is, this building serves as a, a great example of how you can reuse a building that was getting a little tired and uh, wasn't demanding the highest rental incomes for the owners. Uh, and uh, the, out, the end outcome, there was no detrimental effect compared to a new build. It, it, it provided that wow office space. Uh, I'm going to discuss a few a bit more closer to home. So this one is uh, a building we're quite proud of in Leeds. And in fact, we have most of our Christmas dues in here. Uh, so this is, uh, again, this the majority of the Carlsberg site was uh, re uh, removed and knocked down once they stopped uh, uh, brewing production there. And they kept the, the uh, head office portion of it with, with more kind of impressive features and uh, again this the, the the embodied carbon of this project was was very low as well and that was driven a lot by the funding and and there wasn't a lot of money to to kind of adapt this building so everything had to be to offer a lot of value and be very well considered so what we we crawled all over this building as structural engineers right at the start trying to figure out exactly how it works where there were some uh, opportunities and uh, we managed to identify from, from site surveys and record drawings, there was uh, areas of flaws that were non-original that could be removed without, with, without structural strengthening, uh, that the staircases could be opened up. There was, so it was kind of trying to make a big impact on the internal environment without having to spend a lot of money in doing so. Uh, and then this is just a, a photo from the back showing kind of what it was like at the start of the project. So with the, with the adjoining buildings demolition, uh, there was a, a, quite a lot of leaking roof and also it was basically fairly poor condition inside. Uh, also an interesting thing on this job was uh, they reused everything in here, not just the structural elements, they, they kind of tried to embody that in everything they did they were they were taking uh, paneling from certain areas and making uh, tables in the restaurant for it and cafe so it was really really good project and one of the next ones i'll go on to is uh, the playhouse in leeds which uh, is one of my favorite buildings in leeds to be honest uh, the entrance i really like the new entrance uh, and one of the main issues with the original building which uh, was designed uh, by in the early 90s by arab so uh, this is actually a draw uh, a photo pulled off our archives so the the entrance before was kind of it wasn't facing the city and it it, it wasn't the grand entrance you'd, you'd expect of such a venue and also the accessibility around the building was was uh, it was compromised and uh, also they had they had two theaters and a lot of the production comments was that one was too big and one was too small and a lot of the productions wanted something in the middle so that was something they had to try and address so the the, the, the big kind of adaptations they did to this building was creating this new wow entrance on, on a fairly small footprint and also uh, using existing record drawings and structural interventions to increase the size of the smaller lecture theatre by uh, actually removing some rock bed. Uh, and the next project I'm going to move on to is one of my projects, which uh, I worked on for six and a half years, which has recently been handed over uh, to. Uh, so this is the York Guildhall in, in the centre of York. Uh, the, the client was the City of York Council and the occupier now is York University. So the, the buildings were mixed in terms of age 
and heritage. So the, the original Guildhall uh, dates back to the 15th century. Uh, it was unfortunately bombed in the war as well. So there was a, a lot of bomb damage that has been uh, remediated in the 80s. And then a lot of the, the rest of the complex was, was added in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, one, of, one of the big objectives and challenges of this project was the, the access between the various buildings was really poor and uh, it, it, was, it just wasn't suitable to kind of the standards we provide these days. Uh, there was also uh, one of the problems I had to solve was there was quite a, a significant uh, crack in the, in the end of the building where the tower is and that the, build, the building was actually split in half and it was active as well. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, a movement that had uh, stopped moving and we could just fix it. We had to kind of uh, underpin it to prevent any more movement. Uh, and one of the big challenges for everyone involved, uh, in, especially the contractor, was the site is physically constrained on all sides. It, so it's backed onto by all the properties on Lendl Street and then you've also got the river. Uh, and the just as out of interest, the complex does have kind of civic community and council use, so it is a really important building for York for uh, various different uh, sectors of people. So the engineering challenges was uh, uh, so the the building was uh, required underpinning, and uh, it wasn't until we we did lots of uh, site investigations prior to tender and construction, but it wasn't until we actually started the job that we uh, unearthed the problem, which was a large spreader arch below ground, uh, which had uh, cracked and rotated, uh, and it was uh, and one of the sides was settling relative to the other, and it, that that small rotation at the base of the building was creating quite a large crack towards the top. Uh, we couldn't, there was a lot of uh, piling equipment that we couldn't get into site. So the, the solution was to actually jack pile using the building self-weight because there was a lot of self-weight. The walls were uh, substantial and it, the opportunity to actually use that to enable the, uh, the rig to be, well, you can see it in that photo on the right. It, it's just uh, uh, some pneumatic jacks that just uh, anchor against, uh, ground beams and piles. So the just this photo really emphasizes the challenge in terms of uh, getting things to site. So this was a pontoon that needed to be floated down with a crawler crane on to enable the tower crane to be constructed. And this had to come back at the end again to dismantle the tower crane. Uh, all the demolition waste had to had to be uh, uh, navigated up and down the river, taken out via the river. The, the, the location of where the materials were, were put onto the boats also had to be uh, dismantled within a few hours if there was a flood warning. So it had to be really mobile. And also the, the bridge clearances. So the, if the river was at a certain height, they couldn't bring anything to site because the, uh, the barges couldn't get under the under the bridges so yeah there was it was definitely interesting and it actually dictated the way that the uh, the structure was formed uh, we had a lot of early contractor involvement uh, during the design stage which uh, resulted in complete change in material for the framing but based on what materials they could get to site so uh, another area i'm passion, passionate about is kind of uh, digital aspects and I think the the benefits of using it within retrofit uh, are huge. Uh, so one of the things we've we've done recently is created uh, a full digital twin model of Leeds Station. Uh, we've, as you can see from the image there, we've we've actually modelled quite a large area of the station and surrounding buildings. Uh, so digital twin, the what we've used is actually. It uses gaming technology and it's something that we're seeing more and more. Gaming technology has been, been around for quite some time, but it's uh, quite new to the construction industry and the, the benefits are huge. 
the the a lot of the production time is uh, reduced because it uses AI rather than kind of tracing of point clouds, which is fairly typical. And also the data volumes are a lot smaller than than a lot of the big point cloud data, which can be fairly uh, problematic on jobs. So quite a few are up into kind of like the 500 gig. The appearance of these is amazing. And if I show you a video next, hopefully that demonstrates it better than what I can say. So if you're from Leeds, you should be able to recognize this fairly easy. I think this is platform eight. So this is uh, basically following the train. Uh, a lot of these digital twins are also used for kind of uh, train driver simulations and uh, construction programming uh, visualizations. Uh, so it's used by multiple members of the team throughout the, the life of the project. On the guild hall, we we use the Matterplot camera for the DLAP surveys, but the, it has massive benefits for all of the design team. Uh, the architects use it all the time. You can you can visit site from your desk all the time. You can uh, it captures the entire building in three D uh, quite quickly, and we use it a lot on on basically we use it as standard on all our retrofit projects. Uh, one of my other big projects I'm involved in is Temple Works in Leeds, which is an amazing grade one listed building. Uh, I'm not going to uh, go into the detail of the heritage of the building. I'm just going to discuss some of the digital survey techniques that we've been using at Temple Works because it's currently uh, unsafe to access. So we're, we've had to be use a bit of lateral thinking and, and, and solve problems in different manners. So in order to, this is just an example of kind of how we've used the information. So in order to uh, kind of get data for the inside, we we used a, a robot well, and a remote, it's basically a posh remote control car uh, to capture what the scanner there is a Matterport scanner, but we, we, we also ran a LiDAR scanner on there. And then uh, one of the, one of the uh, connection components for the building, the only one that, is actually accessible due to, a, uh, which is because it's removed from the collapse, every, everything else is hidden, is actually sat on the floor of the main mill for safekeeping. However, we can't go in there and access it with a tape measure as you would normally would uh, due to safety reasons. So we've uh, we've used the LiDAR scan and then we've created uh, a 3D Revit model from, from that LiDAR scan. And then we also, and then to help explain how the connections work, which is an amazing, uh, piece of engineering that uh, from its original construction, we've built uh, 3D printed models, which is actually a working model. You can pull the pins out and, and take the ties out and 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 just show people how, how this building was put together and, and how we need to remediate it. Uh, another technology which is massively useful on retrofit, uh, especially heritage projects, is, is photogrammetry. So this is a a photogrammetry model of Temple Works, which was captured using 9,000 drone photos. And then, uh, for, so it's a full envelope model. And uh, as you zoom in, the quality is photographic level quality. So there's an example of just zooming in on, on one element of the facade. So you can see how, how important it is for, uh, especially heritage architects, to, to allow them to undertake all their, all their processes. Uh, We've also been involved in Leeds Digital Festival for a couple of years. Uh, and again, this covers uh, Temple Works. So in the first one, we created a, a VR model to allow people to, to do a virtual tour of Temple Works, because uh, again, it's unsafe to access, but a lot of people are really interested in this building. And this allows that. So we did that for the Digital Festival, but we've also used it quite a lot since for for kind of the contractors used it for planning works on the roof, which has to be all accessed via cranes. And also uh, it's been used for party wall agreements, looking at boundaries. Uh, so it's been really useful. Um, and this is, this is just an actual uh, video of, of, the, of the VR, of someone in the VR. Uh, next one was we did, we hosted a, a webinar and this is just a test one. We, it was, it was in the midst of lockdown. So this was a, 
a test where we we did the webinar from the green uh, VR room in Leeds, and this uh, green. So we use green screen technology, uh, and we built a, a, a digital model and kind of replicated uh, in there. But again, this this is more towards the fun element than actually we don't use we haven't used this on a project. Uh, so that's the end of my slides. Thank you for listening. That looked great fun um, <laughs> and very convincing. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for that, Rick. Um, again, maybe Claude, any any, any initial uh, comments you want to make? I've got a couple of things I want to ask you. Um, yes, I've, um, I've uh, been working on these technologies recently with my students and I'm really amazed how a surface, because effectively it's photography, the surface of photography that's just digitalized into 3, 3D, amazes you to see an incredible amount of detail. And as you say, you don't have to go back to site and worry about whether you receive some information or not, or you can get additional information. I, I think for monitoring a building, it might be very useful as well. Uh, you, you know, monitoring, you know, molds, growth, uh, certain areas of thermal, Efficiency at certain times of year might be a very useful tool to have. Yeah, it's exactly. Nice. There's, there's huge potential for this technology. We uh, we we met up with Lee, some colleagues from uh, some colleagues at Leeds Uni yesterday, and they were there working on uh, artificial intelligence using photogrammetry to do uh, crack detections. So yeah, there's, there's 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 this technology can be used from many different disciplines for all kinds of great things. I, I'm interested in, um, uh, you know, the, the, the use of the technology um, itself and whether, I mean, clearly it's a huge aid to, um, you know, restoring or refurbishing or retrofitting a building, uh, being able to use these sorts of technologies. So it's a, it's, a use, it's a nice thing to have. It's a useful thing to have. But, you know, in terms of, like a carbon saving, thinking about somewhere like Temple Works, where I, I know there are real issues with actually gaining access to that building that, that you know, sending people in, uh, you know, at the moment is, is very, very tricky. So using drones and, and, and using technology, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like uh, bomb, bomb, you know, bomb diffusing bombs, isn't it? You know, you send the robot to do it rather than a human. It's almost that sort of situation. But, you know, do, do you think about that in terms of the carbon saving that you make, as well as the fact that it's a useful technique? Uh, we haven't, but I can confirm it definitely saves carbon in terms of transport. The Matterport does. Uh, so on the Guildhall, for example, the, the architects were London based and it, it minimized their requirement for site visits like hugely mm. they could just access site whenever they wanted and capture the information because it, it could be as little as oh was it, how does the roof drain is there a, is there a downpipe there and they might not have taken a photo last time they were site but it's just everything's captured so they can just check things like this for, at the desk uh, so it's, there's a lot of efficiencies for design teams yeah, I, I think that that's something that maybe you know you don't immediately appreciate, but you know, mm. in a building in a building like that, where you're sort of having to do some of these things out of necessity, as much as you know, out of yeah. you know, this is the right technology to use. Actually, it's a it's a choice that you that you that you have to make probably in those instances. That then you, that there are actually other benefits that flow from that, and I think that's quite an interesting interesting mm -hmm. one so susan has just said and, I, and I, I agree it would be nice at some point rick maybe to hear a bit more about the techly building um because obviously we've, we've that, that that is a, a building in leeds that um uh is in the center of this huge new development uh the bastint scheme um and uh, the air park's going to be there so yeah. it becomes quite an important it, 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 it build, it's an important building now and the, its use is really really valued but it becomes you know even more important five years down down the line doesn't it when that area has, has mm. completely changed um that, so yeah that won't be a problem i'll uh, 
I'll volunteer my colleague Rachel for that one, who should have joined me today. Okay, well, we might we might take we might take you up on that. She, okay. she she that was her project, so she she'll give you a much better presentation than I will. So I'll volunteer for that one. But yeah, it's it's a project where where proud of and, and like we say we we actually use the venue quite a yeah. lot yeah so so someone say it, were they were the wood paneling was the wood paneling from the rooms used to make tables is that what you said i believe so That's yeah I yeah told, yeah I the boardroom i think was kept as it was um i think that was that was that was the case yeah um yeah. look that was that was really that was really good rick thanks thanks for that i'm conscious of time so i'm going to move on to, to page park and i don't know um is it uh Eamon or jess uh I'm glad you could join us Eamon. sorry about the uh, the dodgy link i probably sent you earlier on that's probably why you couldn't get through oh, um, not a problem. but um i don't know which of you wants want, uh, wants to wants to kick off but um you know please please go ahead thanks yeah, um, Eamon's I, driving it today yeah, if i got leading jess can jump in if i make any Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, let's see. Okay. Can you see that? Okay, is that in full it's screen? About, yeah, it's coming up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah full screen. Okay. Um, yep. I think today we're going to talk about heritage retrofit or retrofit and that heritage setting uh, specifically today, just to kind of keep it focused. Um. A little bit about who we are. Um, we're Page Park Architects with offices in Glasgow and Leeds. Um, I think we think of ourselves as a reuse practice. Um, we're kind of 40 years in practice and we had our beginnings in the tenement refurb. Um, um, for, you, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's our kind of localised Scottish Glasgow high density urban flatted developments, historic um, residential. Um, and that's you know kind kind of been a driver our deep interest and in, and knowledge of vernacular buildings, um, and we take a holistic approach to creating sustainable places. Um, here's a few images of projects of ours which I hope to kind of um, illustrate our diverse um, approach to uh, retrofitting buildings. You know, um, on the left, I think which uh, Rick spoke about is the Leeds Playhouse, which is a refurb and extension of a late 80s, early 90s, I think it was finished in the 90s uh, building. Um, top right, we have Roslyn the Visitor Centre at Roslyn Castle. And that's an estate, um, you know, with some of the buildings dating back, uh, you know, 600 years or more. Um, bottom right is, a, that was our refurb of an existing 60s building, education building for University of Edinburgh. And the kind of bottom left, uh, that's another more recent tenement refurb here in Glasgow at 166 Gorbel Street, um, one of the last standing buildings in that area, um, an area that was subject to one of Glasgow's notorious waves of demolition and, and rebuild, um, where we've demolished, you know, good building stock, replace with high rises and demolish them again. Um, and now I've come back to the kind of appropriate um, rebuild of um, the kind of appropriate mid-rise scale of, uh, of residential uh, housing. Um, yeah, sometimes we're, we can be quite bold in our interventions. Um, you know, we make meaningful interventions based on a kind of sound understanding of the significance of buildings. On the left, we've got the Print makers in Edinburgh. Uh, we kind of opened up, um, cut down existing windows to ground level to create a new entrance. Um, and on the right, uh, this is the castle uh, at Roslyn Castle Estate. Um, one part of it is in a fairly ruinous condition, and we're looking to consolidate the ruins and um, roof over uh, the, the former Great Hall to kind of create a, a couple of new rooms, uh, living space, kitchen, and a bedroom. And the, the tower element to the right. Uh, to kind of consolidate this, give them in our room to, to let out and to kind of safeguard it financially and in and, uh, and fabric terms for, for the future. Um, I suppose in the past, our intuitive, our approach to sustainability was intuitive, um, you know, felt correct to reuse and retain existing structures and choose natural or sympathetic materials, um, you know, because that's what we'll, you know, tends to work with existing structures. Um, our approach has developed significantly in recent years, um, you know, in a direct response to the climate emergency and to leaps in knowledge and understanding and how we can address our, our impact as building professionals um, in terms of carbon emissions. Um, so it's setting standards, um, you know, there's there's a plethora of guidance and, and uh, uh, information out there as to what 
standards we should be pursuing, you know, in terms of embodied carbon and operational carbon. Um, and we, we've kind of based our approach on current advice and standards. Um, <laughs> targets for new bills tend to be more consolidated and defined. Um, you know, they're kind of guided by statutory um, uh, authorities and things like passive house approaches, you know, which have very defined metrics and approaches and um, criteria to define that and the results um, for existing buildings, the approach is kind of, there's a wider range and it's more nuanced. You know, we have ranges of uh, approaches even in the kind of retrofit canon or the uh, NFIT canon, NFIT or, uh, you know, the elemental approach. Um, and obviously we've got the L LETI Climate Emergency Retrofit Guide, LETI um, London Energy Transformation Initiative. Um, so the, the challenge for us is, you know, what standards or what targets we're setting ourselves. Um, and on the bottom left is a kind of a screenshot of the kind of various, um, you know, targets uh, from the NRF guidance, you know, which are, you know, are all dependent on, you know, orientation, climate zone, um, whether you insulate internally, externally, um, you know, uh, your orientation, um, you know, whether it's a roof, floor, wall, and then, you know, what's the attitude to ventilation and so what, what's required. Um, so, as I said, as we mostly deal with existing buildings, our challenge has been, has been to determine what's an appropriate set of relevant goals. Uh, this is what I pulled this from a more recent project as well. It's just actually trying to define a baseline so to kind of pull together, you know, what are all the kind of various criteria from different standards, you know, building control, what our service consultant was advising, and the LETI targets, and what ultimately became the project targets, with which were um, kind of worked out from what we could, you know, practically achieve um, relative to the this building constraints in this instance, um, you know, there's certain constraints and that's alluded to in something like the Letty retrofit uh, guidance, you know, constrained retrofit, unconstrained or um, best uh, best targets. Um, so and we have, uh, this building in particular had a, a refurb element and a new build extension part, which again kind of goes some way to demonstrate the challenges that, you know, we face practical terms when we approach the building, when it moves beyond, you know, um, kind of metric targets, you know, well, what happens when we're, you know, we're sticking on an extension to an existing part, you know, how do we treat that? How do we, how does it work holistically? How do we avoid unintended consequences? What's the right level of insulation before we, we, we kind of get towards the realms of unintended consequences with moisture movement in an existing building? So uh, I thought this just putting the, the metrics and a table was quite helpful for us just to understand where we were kind of exceeding standards or just on the kind of borderline or, you know, um, well, I don't think we demonstrate that we're less than the statutory um, standards in this instance, um, even though it was, it's quite a constrained building. So um, it was good to kind of set it out like this and that kind of defines, you know, our approach um, at that stage. Um, yeah, and once you kind of move beyond um, uh, you know, set the targets, you know, some methodologies to achieve these targets, you know, how do we, you know, what's our practical guidance for translating the metrics into details? Um, and these are a couple of guides that we can refer to quite often in the office, you know, Guide to Energy Retrofit of Traditional Buildings, which has been prepared by Historic Environment Scotland. And on the right, it's a Sustainable Renovation Guide, and it's more tailored towards domestic retrofit. Uh, again, practical guidance um, for us. But when we kind of move kind of into more real, you know, you know, what methodologies are right for what project, you know, um, and they're okay, you know, it's, it's kind of like more of a uh, bespoke approach. And like two we're kind of engaging with at the moment. On the left, we have the Sustainable Traditional Building Alliance um, guidance, and then this really um, kind of interactive wheel um, where you can kind of ascertain at a kind of early stage level, you know, what might be the the consequences of uh, different insulation strategies, like internal, uh, external, roof, wall, floor, um, what uh, kind of raises, you know, a traffic light system of risks uh, uh, that might occur um, for the building fabric, and uh, what kind of methodology or frameworks that would um, be appropriate to kind of govern the approach. Um, and it's a whole building approach, you know, how we tackle different piecemeal changes and how that might affect the uh, building equilibrium 
um, and it flags as potential consequences. On the right, we've passed 2035, um, which is a framework for delivering um, retrofit for domestic properties. Um, it's kind of tailored to uh, local authorities, and it's it was, uh, produced as a kind of response to all those terrible retrofits that we had in the 80s and 90s, um, which you'll, you, you may be aware of when you can you see uh, external wall insulation on uh, council properties that kind of stop and start around meter boxes and rainwater goods, uh, which have had the unintended consequence of, uh, of thermal bridges and mold growth internally and just per performance. And a lot of these, in these instances, it's been removed and we're having to start again at great cost to you know, local authorities and um, taxpayer in general. Um, and this is a kind of quality assurance system that, you know, develops it you know, provides a framework you know so it, uh, it talks in terms of a medium term plan uh, one that can be developed and managed over time and uh, allows you know to reduce the kind of implications of shallow retrofit and allows owners to make sensible improvements over time uh, which will match their investment and budget and contains trigger points and provides options for um, combinations of um, uh, strategies like a common for example a common approach might be walls and windows or floors and uh, roof insulation, um, which uh, kind of work together quite well. That kind of brings us full circle to a more recent project that I think Jess is working on. Um, and it's a tenement study we're doing for a local authority in Glasgow. Um, it's a tenement study we're undertaking, uh, hopes to define and implement targets for, uh, and, uh, for operational and body carbon and uh, a responsible methodology. Um, in this instance, the SBTA will you know, show us how improvements we're considering affect how the building works, what other interventions may be triggered and consequences. Um, you know, from, kind of listening out from minor to, to major concern. And so it's quite handy as a methodology. Um, I think what those two methodologies kind of tell us is um, we really need to understand how buildings perform in terms of their building physics. Um, you know, especially uh, you know, from modern building construction to historic, I think a lot of the problems we see in historic building retrofit is when modern techniques and materials are applied to historic fabric without understanding how well one historic buildings perform and to how modern materials um, uh, work. Uh, on the left, again, I can see this diagram basically kind of compares motion movement with a modern building and a traditional building. Um, modern buildings are generally kind of Moisture closed, uh, feature pervious materials. Um, to try to keep the water out, basically. You know, a lot of uh, DPCs, DPMs, um, the clad in generally is uh, the water isn't meant to kind of go beyond the uh, the outer leaf or certainly the ventilation zone. And there's kind of designed in ventilation. You know, the moisture's uh, hopefully um, removed from the building in that respect. Older buildings with their construction. Um, on the right, we have you know kind of traditional. Um, solid stone wall construction, um, generally made of natural materials, timber, lime, plaster, stone, um, um, and these kind of f perform the moisture characteristics of the two are very different. And it's uh, traditional more oil, moisture open uh, in design, you know, any vapor um, that's produced in the building by um, cooking uh, occupants or um, uh, otherwise. Um, can be absorbed by the building fabric, um, and then over time, during the kind of uh, the day, uh, buffered back into the um, existing building. Similarly, with um, external moisture, if it's just driven into stonework, you know, and that's um, wet, it can evaporate out over time, or migrate depending on the time of year or the again, um, the, uh, the climate conditions can migrate through the building into the fabric uh, without any real kind of issues. Um, because it's generally kind of well ventilated just through its um, leakiness and open fires and and um, ventilation. And where we tend to find problems with this is when, you know, um, retrofit then kind of changes that equilibrium in the building and the, the dynamic um, where it's become more airtight um, or we're not, uh, or the wrong materials are used, so they're not impaired, uh, they're not um, hygroscopic. We can't let moisture in or out. Uh, and, um, Modern ways of living produce more um, moisture in the building, um, which isn't always um, adequately extracted from the building. Um, yeah. Again, this diagram just shows a little bit more about how um, uh, moisture is transferred um, 
around the woven fabric. And, and again, I think what we're finding more and more now is, you know, this is kind of developing. It's not a static thing, you know, when climate's changing, you know, we're seeing wetter um, weather, especially up here in Scotland where the stone's getting more saturated, it's taking longer to dry out, you know, more of, it, more of the moisture's finding its way into the bone. And, um, you know, the way so we love changes, you know, um, there's kind of more moisture being um, produced internally. Um, you know, um, so this is something we're always conscious about now, about, you know, about very, very meticulous and forensic about what our interventions mean for how a building performs uh, at the moment. Uh, so again, you know, if we kind of then focus that into, you know, choice making, how we make choices for insulating a building, if we take a solid stone wall, wall for example, you know, um, on the image on the right or diagram on the right shows a kind of traditional solid stone wall with a laughing plaster um, finish internally, you know, um, we have options how we might insulate a wall, uh, either external wall insulation or internal wall insulation. And the decision making process and that is largely governed by, you know, a lot of fact, uh, many factors, you know. External wall insulation may not be possible or desirable for a number of reasons, um, historical constraints that the bulb may be listed, um, maybe too many junctions or uh, uh, the profile of the facade may not be uh, appropriate for external wall insulation, the material, uh, you know, uh, might be appropriate. Um, uh, it may be appropriate on one side of the building, not the other, you know, but then, you know, how does, how does it meet uh, when you turn the corner um, on the, uh, but obviously um, the kind of criteria that govern external wall insulation, um, if you're insulating externally, um, you need to achieve a, a, a better U value um, because it's, um, uh, <clears throat> assumed that there's less constraints with the the, the, the amount of insulation you can apply to the front. Um, um, obviously, the benefits of external wall insulation is you kind of benefit from thermal mass of the, the, the stone construction. You know, if uh, that's heated up generally, it can release it slowly back into the building over, uh, over night time. Um, the other option on the right, uh, internal wall insulation, and sometimes that's the only option um, for uh, insulating the external walls for, for the kind of reasons I talked about. Um, again, where that becomes trickier is, you know, there's a there's a kind of optimum kind of thickness there that, that's permissible in terms, before we get into the issues with, you know, where the the condensation, the dew point happens, um, you know, this kind of a general rule of thumb um, was, you know, 80 to 100, or 80 to 100 mil um, before you kind of start um, changing the equilibrium of how that build up performs and you start getting risks and and that's you know uh, when you start getting beyond that kind of thickness here and to you know having to get assessments of uh, high growth thermal performance and with the calculations uh, uh, which ideally we we try to avoid um, and again this kind of this approach would you know if, if there's a if there's a, a feeling that there's a kind of risk of you know uh, moisture build up with this approach, you know, you really need to consider you know what happens to junctions with floor joists or wall pan and such like um, but yes, but sometimes that's the only way. And obviously, there's kind of all implications in terms of um, what that does to the um, uh, kind of usual floor air inside of these of internal rooms, etc. Um, but again, this kind of for us, is, you know, this kind of forensic level interrogation of how we approach, you know, uh, elemental kind of upgrades. You know, uh, you know, we kind of feel this like we're always becoming building pathologists and building scientists, and that overlap with you know what. Previously, would have been solely advice from a service consultant. It's kind of that's um, coming together and overlapping a lot. You know, we kind of feel like there's a, a lot of dialogue between two um, disciplines. Um, even when we did, the, um, well, I'm a British accredited passive house designer as well. When we did the course, um, and it was noted that services consultants should really kind of brush up on the um, building technology aspect of it and the architects kind of focus more on the maths and the building physics and the, um, get the calculators um, sharpened up. So, and yeah, it does feel like there's a lot more kind of synergy in an approach uh, now, which is, is, is really positive. Again, um, <clears throat> yeah, where that becomes really tricky is in all the kind of tricky details where we kind of meet windows and, um, Floor buildups, you know, and uh, again, this is kind of where I think a lot of the performance uh, gap issues uh, are emanating from is, you know, where um, you can have to apply uh, logic to certain details, you know, where you kind of minimize thermal um, bridging at the at details and what they'll do to the overall building performance. And I think that's what we've seen with uh, previously uh, 
incorrect retrofitting options. They didn't really kind of appreciate that thoroughly. And it wasn't a whole building approach. It was a piecemeal and didn't deal with projections and um, interfaces um, appropriately. Yeah, so potential and uh, consequences. Um, and that's something that you know, needs to be kind of forefront when we're kind of developing a plan is, you know, um, when we improve air, tight, uh, air tightness and what that, what does that do to moisture ingress and what moisture movement within the building? Um, that kind of leads us on. This is something that pass, you know, governs is you know, review of ventilation strategies. How do we get the moisture out of the building? And review of material permeability, what's the right material choice? You know, we 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 advocate natural materials for you know both for their embodied low embodied carbon uh, reasons and for their you know hygroscopic um properties, you know, their ability to get moisture out of the building. Um, so building equilibrium is key for us. I think. Um, but the mo mantra, I think, for us, you know, when we approach retrofit is, you know, build tight um, and ventilate right. And again, not to advocate um, for one methodology or another, but the retrofit um, approach um, it's defined in past 2035 is, is quite, quite helpful in terms of how we kind of weigh up cost benefit analysis in terms of you know um, 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 what we might do within a time scale you know versus capital cost and the carbon cost effectiveness effectiveness and the level of disruption that might be uh, might be um, inherent in an approach you know from walls roofs windows doors and air tightness measures um, and a big part of that then is uh, identifying the risk profile for the building and developing a whole dwelling assessment and the improvement option evaluation. And then that kind of leads into a, a medium term improvement plan uh, in which you can embed the um, you know, trigger points for um, you know, when, when certain um, improvements might occur. And again, this kind of will, this kind of helps set the scene for future proofing. You know, from you can't do at all one one time you might be able to, you know, if you're um, only doing um, certain level of service intervention, you might be able to, you know, uh, ensure that you provide larger radiators to deal with maybe um, a change over from fossil fuel heating to air source heat pumps at a later date. Or um, if you're changing over the kind of heat, uh, heating system and you're putting in a new hot water boiler, you might be able to ensure that there's a, a coil in that that then could take um, solar thermal panels at a later date, you know, so it's all about, you know, creating that kind of whole building plan um, against a kind of time frame. Uh, so we don't, get, we don't prevent any, uh, you know, future kind of um, beneficial improvements in the, in the long term. Yeah, um, I kind of maybe jump into a more, re you know, one of our latest potential projects, um, you know, where we've kind of ability to, you know, uh, kind of look at, you know, a range of choices, you know. So every approach is different. You know, what's the right choice? Um, this is a kind of historic stable um, block, uh, a collection of stable buildings in Glasgow. Um, it's got numerous different constraints, um, but potentially a lot of possibilities. Um, you know, the buildings range from uh, quite significant um, listed 17th century buildings uh, right through to you know um, 19th century buildings, which have a lower listing um, to a 20th, 20th century edition, um, which um, has no listing at all. So um, this is quite interesting for us, you know, because, you know, the listed buildings have, you know, uh, quite a constrained sandstone facade. So the options there may only be to um, insulate um, internally. The sawmill, um, again, that's conceived potentially as a, you know, an unheated open space, you know, so that all kind of a different kind of set of um, requirements. In the 20th century edition, that's kind of an unlisted rendered building. So um, there's a potential there to, you know, phase that and insulate it externally. And it could be a test bed for our approach. You know, we could um, look at um, how it might be monitored um, and uh, evaluated um, if that's the initial phase, you know, which might inform kind of our developments uh, for the other more historically sensitive phases of the project. Um, so um, that's, uh, we're quite excited about that. Um, and again, you know, it kind of fits in with our kind of internal uh, sustainable approach, you know, about, you know, fabric first, you know, um, the kind of easiest thing first, um, which is, you know, uh, consolidating the existing fabric, stopping where the, the uncontrolled leaks or moisture is entering the building, um, you know, um, Increasing air tightness, um, improving the insulation and the building performance in terms of um, heat loss, um, then it's the efficient systems and um, you know new systems, you know um, from low carbon or zero carbon sources, um, 
ventilated correctly with um, heat recovery um, as, if possible, um, being mindful of our unregulated unre energy use, so always specifying a low energy fittings. Um, but again, a project like this like, will give us the opportunity to maybe kind of push that design further into the realms of regenerative design, you know, where we can, where does this site kind of give us additional opportunity, opportunities to benefit a more sustainable kind of approach and rainwater harvesting, you know, biodiversity, and, you know, can we, you know, meaningfully at the early stage incorporate, um, you know, areas for like, you know, food growth, could, which could, um, growing food, which could be used in the kind of new cafe area. Um, yeah, so it's a kind of you know it's a holistic and a whole approach uh, um, we're kind of hoping for an approach like this. So, um, but yeah, incremental approach and that kind of fits with our kind of learning as we go. So, and I'll just finish an, an issue uh, image of what that could be in the future. So, thanks very much. That's fantastic, Hayman. Um... I have a lot of questions, uh, but we're very, very short on time. Uh, Martin had to leave, as did Rick as well. So I'm going to be putting these questions to you and to Jess. So the, the very first one of them is um, David Dobson, who introduced the whole webinar series and mm -hmm. who is the builder specialized in older buildings, although he does new, new build as well, said that he preferred working with older buildings and that it was actually easier. Would you say, would you agree with this? Working with existing buildings, um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily, necessarily easier. I think it's the right thing to do. And I think there's massive benefits in terms of your body carbon and, um, uh, you know, for clients with existing buildings about, you know, the time it will take to occupy the kind of refer building as opposed to rebuilding from new. Um, is it easier? Uh, I wouldn't say so. Um, I think it's it's generally a lot trickier. Um, yeah, and it gives us a lot of headaches. Yeah, um, <laughs> but opportunities as well. I think, you know, there's um, it certainly has had, it's made us have to really kind of interrogate our approach and upskill quite quickly and never stop asking questions about what the choices we make and whether the right choices, what combinations and, you know, um, it kind of feels like the narrative has moved on as well from, you know, across the board from clients to consultants and consumers, you know, and that's, I think, you know, we maybe touch upon the earlier talks about, you know, well, why should, you know, developers or others or other building owners um, retrofit? Well, there's kind of a, you know, maybe a, a, um, a um, reputational aspect to that too, which, you know, I think we try and discuss with our clients as well, you know, um, will your asset be stranded in the future? Will it be looked upon unfavorably in the near future that you've had a choice and you've made one that's maybe not um, the right choice in terms of the building's performance? I yeah. found it very interesting that Islam work was clearly targeted as though uh, at um, a very large majority of developers who can't see the benefits mm. of so doing. And so she's invented new quantification systems to demonstrate that actually they can profit from this as well as the users and the general public by way of appropriation and love of a building very often. Um, have you ever worked on new build or have you always been working? Because you described yourself as the reuse practice. Uh, yeah, no, we describe ourselves as such because it's a large, kind of uh, the largest proportion of our work. Um, but we do build new build, and uh, a lot of that is housing. Uh, but again, focusing on heritage today, um, you know, in terms of our new build, yeah, um, you know, when we build there, we, we kind of strive for the kind of um, the best standards, um, you know, because we're kind of acutely aware that, you know, I think it's it's beyond 80% now, uh, you mm -hmm. know, I think it's up 1995 of, and 2050 or our building stock will have been already built. So, yeah, um, yeah um, that kind of feels like that, that, that's a kind of separate aspect, you know, that should be dealing with itself, you know, where mm -hmm. the chance for us now is to, you know, not make the, exacerbate the problem, you know, if we're getting the chance now to, you know, retrofit, you know, for a lot of time, a lot of these cases, you know, um, building owners, this might be their only chance or a ch chance in a kind of generation to, 
too upgradable or too retrofit it. So um, key for us is to do it correctly and do it you know, in a way that avoids the issues we've had with you know poor retrofit in the more recent um, more recent um, kind of times in the eighties nineties, where there's kind of been a lack of understanding of how buildings perform and material choices. You know, um, and then we're beyond that even again into you know um, the carbon and body carbon. Death Actually, you gave us a very useful introduction to next week's session, which is on the domestic realm. Mm -hmm. And I had invited the SDBA to give us a breakdown of the whole house approach, but you've just done this and they couldn't make it. So it's extremely useful. Um, Jess, do you want to add any final words before we close? Oh, I suppose I was just um, on the on the point around how you make a make a case for something. I think that one thing that that we we do do is we have we have um, I suppose lots of different client types. Uh, but what we usually find is we're working either with um, end users specifically, which I think helps a lot. I think there is a, a, an issue when you're not working with an end user and you're working with a developer or an investor where they where the challenge is much more difficult to talk about. Whereas when you're working with a, a social housing provider, for example, um, you can start to tie in where it makes um, investment sense for them and where it helps end users. So for example, with the, the, the uh, example we put in the Glasgow tenement, they, they've highlighted issues in, in terms of sort of um, um, a lot of high turnaround on some of their tenants, which causes them financial problems because they have to reassess their buildings. But it's also it causes them sort of social problems within the within the units because there's such a high turnover of people. Whereas actually, if you make comfort a higher um, sort of priority and maybe you reduce living costs, that might actually be able to slightly change their business model or slightly change who they um how they hold on to tenants as opposed to having that constant movement and transientness so that we are often discussing internally where is the logic and how can we sell that to different types of clients as well so as mm -hmm. much as it's on the client's tongue it's also about us understanding that we need to understand them as well and what they need um and this can be often different as opposed to who we're speaking to we have christophe de Moulin here who is asking how often is the decision to refurbish rather than replace I don't know how you would quantify this, but I suppose you turn the sort of comparing with a client a demolition versus a retrofit, maybe as an option. I mean, we do do those as appraisals very early Often on. Often is the decision to refurbish rather than replace, driven by the heart, emotional connection, historical significance, etc., rather than the mind. Mm. Well, we do we do try and kind of respond to that. You know, we try and create places or renew places so they'll be loved or they'll be re-loved and they'll endure. It's kind of harder to want to demolish something you really care about. So. It's an interesting question because it is all about appropriation. Uh, Fran, by the way, the, the first one of the sessions is now on the YouTube channel for the Elite Civic Trust if you want to watch it. Mm -hmm. And the second uh, speaker was Fran Heatherington and she talked about the Gipton Fire Station and the way that it was turned into a community center. And she went in great depth to explain that um, the local community totally appreciated having their building uh, refurbished, repurposed and appropriated. And she very firmly believes that if they'd had a new shiny building somewhere else, this wouldn't have worked. And so there is this whole elements which some might consider in, you know more romantic maybe that yeah. creates this rooting in i think i think that's very true uh, you know talk about the playhouse you know that was that was a building where you know the, the playhouse you know did great things in spite of the building you know and its outward appearance is very municipal and quite unloved you know and a, a, it, you know, objectively faced the wrong part of the city. So our kind of approach to that was to reorientate it, create a new kind of a face on the kind of main street and the approach and give them something that was for them and, um, you know, the, you know, renewed their identity and they felt like they, they kind of had ownership in that. And we, that, you know, the development of the facade and the language that was very much in tandem with them and the creative and department, you know, and so it was for them. And the new space that we created was to kind of support emerging talent, um, you know, um, 
the groups, you know, kind of younger groups and, and kind of more diverse groups. So again, kind of bringing the theatre to them, you know, making sure people knew and felt that the theatre was for them, you know, both from its outward appearance and by the programmes that we were able to support by the new interventions. Hmm. Well, we're going to have to close because yeah. it's nearly a quarter past. Um, I wanted to thank you very much. And it's very interesting how we move from the technicalities to the more emotional and attachment dimensions of this, which can't really be quantified, but I suppose come with experience and knowledge. And so thank you very much. And so next week, the session will be on the domestic realm with uh, about the private domestic realm and the social housing um, element from Leeds City Council as well. So I look forward to seeing you next week and thank you again. And hopefully we get another separate lecture about the tech lead. Thank you. I'm going to close the session now. Bye everyone.